Thank you very much for your very kind introduction and thank you, you all for being here and thank you for this invitation and uh, thank you to Professor Wilson and Professor Mahler, uh, Maher and um, it's a real, real pleasure to be here today and it's also an honor to be in such an extraordinary environment. I've never seen anything quite as grand and beautiful as this um, palace uh, before, especially for somebody like me who you know, who is used to uh, the kind of much more modest premises of a kind of East End London campus. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, uh, just to give you two words about the background of my paper, um, is the result of uh, um, two different projects. An ongoing project has now come to an end, a project called Reimagining, um, Reinventing Democracy in the Mediterranean that has brought together historians of Spain, Portugal, France, um, um, Italy, uh, the Balkans, and the Ottoman world that is resulting in, in, a, in an OUP volume which will come out next year, but is also a part of my ongoing uh, sort of project on Southern Europe in the Age of Revolutions. So um, I'd like to start um, my talk um, with reference to um, a pamphlet published in 1836 by Count Monaldo Leopardi, the father of the far more famous Giacomo. Eh? Uh, um, a pamphlet uh, entitled uh, Le parole di un credente, come le scrisse la Menet quando era un credente, published in Modia. So the words of um, a believer um, um, as were written by la Menet when he was himself. A believer. So in this pamphlet, Count uh, Monaldo, the leading counter-revolutionary intellectual in Italy at the time, challenged the content of Félicité de la Menée's Parole d'un croyant, words of a believer, uh, a text which offered a sort of theology of liberation, suggesting as it did that human liberation and the establishment of the kingdom of God could be achieved on earth through the political emancipation of the people, an emancipation that, uh, um, thanks to democracy, equality, and republicanism, would put an end um, to human exile. Eh? Human exile as a kind of alienation of humanity on earth. So Count Monaldo Leopardi replied in this pamphlet uh, and rewrote this text by La Menée arguing on the contrary that what made humanity exiled on earth was its rebellion to social hierarchies, to religion, and not to social injustice. For Count Monaldo, salvation was not possible on earth, but only after life, in heaven. And um, this could be achieved only by rejecting God's evils. And democracy was one of these evils, along with, of course, the principles of nationality you know, that had been seducing people in Italy at the time. These were major errors. They were both theological and political. And uh, I quote here Count Monaldo, the fatherland um, of man is heaven, and there is no fatherland for the enemy of God. End of quotation. So why is it worth... Uh, um, mentioning or remembering or retrieving the memory of this otherwise minor and forgotten pamphlet. Eh? Um, what does it tell us about the uh, transcultural and, and cultural exchanging taking place uh, within the Italian peninsula, but also um, between the Italian peninsula and the Mediterranean in the 19th century? Well, I hope to provide an answer to this question in my paper in the next 35 minutes or so. And in fact, the uh, 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 sort of starting assumption of my paper is that between the late 18th century and the middle of the 19th century, um, religion represented a vital component um, of the political imagination. As eminent historians of political thought like Gareth Stedman Jones and Christopher Bailey have suggested, in this period no political community could be rethought or refunded outside some sort of religious framework. Yeah. This was of course by no means a peculiarity of uh, the Italian peninsula. 
um, uh, this is true uh, more broadly of the Mediterranean. It is true of the Balkans, but it is also true if we look at the Ibero-American world and Asia. So um, what I will focus here is a, a discussion of these themes um, in Italy and within the Mediterranean region, and with it I mean uh, the, the, the territories stretching from the Iberian Peninsula uh, to the Middle East, um, roughly, including France, um, um, of course. So although the relationship between religion and politics varied enormously from region to region, from locality to locality, there are some common features that can be detected. Um, first of all, this is a period where the idea of nationality first emer emerged historically, and in fact, when it did emerge and it did develop in this period, it was by and uh, uh, large uh, defined as a religiously homogeneous and intolerant entity. Nations were religiously homogeneous and intolerant in nature. Um, so its association with the uh, religious toleration was in fact still rare and controversial at the time, and more often than none, citizenship rights were often defined by religion. The second shared feature that we can detect in this period is that because everywhere religion remained contested ground between those in favor or against political change, uh, Monaldo Leopardi was against political change, of course, Religion and religious arguments deeply affected political uh, mobilization, whether in the form of revolution, anti-colonial and anti-imperial rebellions, or counter-revolutions as well, thus advancing or setting limits to the politicization of society. So revolution, reform, and crucially new notions of democracy or challenges to it Count Monaldo was challenging the notion of democracy, came precisely out of this renegotiation of the moral and political content of religion. So my paper argues, this is the core um, of my paper, what I hope to demonstrate, um, that a common feature of post-revolutionary debates on the political role of the people, the one advanced by La Menée and challenged by Monaldo Leopardi, was that religion played a twofold role. On the one hand, that of legitimizing power, people's power, but on the other, that of providing those unshakable ethical foundations that would make new political experiments possible and prevent the uh, disorder and violence that it was feared might otherwise accompany them. So as I said, you know, this is very much a, a feature of a post-revolutionary era, the one I'm talking about, the one in which uh, uh, um, we can understand Monaldo's sort of, um, um, sort of outraged reaction to Lamennais' uh, theology of liberation. The age of revolution that starts um, in the Mediterranean with the impact that the French Revolution had on, on, on these kind of uh, Mediterranean um, margins. Uh, so one of the challenges, in fact, that local patriots and um, republicans had, those who supported the French revolutionary ideals uh, in, 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 in around the Mediterranean, was uh, that of uh, 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 kind of um, stemming popular hostility against attacks to the church, which provoked allegations of impiety. So what was urgently uh, needed was to resolve the religious question. And uh, <clears throat> one of the ways in which uh, uh, early Mediterranean Republicans, and uh, uh, to begin with, in fact, Italian Republicans uh, uh, came up with in the 1790s, uh, was um, to uh, argue in favor of the compatibility between democracy and Christianity. And in fact, um, we found in the Italian peninsula some of the earliest uses, political uses, of democracy in a positive sense uh, um, in the 1790s. Uh, let me quote uh, from a political catechism that was widely circulating in the Italian republics at the time. 
And I quote, Christian religion is founded on two principles. That is God's love and loving your neighbor. Democracy removes all usurpations, pressures, acts of violence. It makes us look upon all men as brothers. It works wonders in propagating love for one's neighbor. Can brothers love each other <clears throat> without loving their common fatherland, their common benefactor? Thus, democracy is founded on the same principles as Christian religion. A good Christian must be a good democrat. Well, in, in reality, this Republican attempt to create a religion compatible with their political belief uh, um, failed to, to meet the support of the majority of the populations in the Italian peninsula, it was greeted either with blank indifference or with the hostility of the people involved in the insurgenze. Uh, and in fact, this was um, acknowledged early on, for instance, by people like Vincenzo Cuoco, who argued that the Republicans had failed to resolve, to transform their revolution into a religious uh, revolution. A rather more successful attempt to combine revolution and religion took place during the Napoleonic Wars, not in the Italian peninsula, but in Spain, where the patriotic struggle against the French oppressor, often described as the Antichrist, uh, guaranteed popular support for a constitutional order, eh? defending however, the Catholic nature of the country. This is the famous Cadiz Constitution of 1812 that declared that the people were sovereign, but declared that the nation was sovereign as the uh, sovereign people, but declared at the same time that the nation was Catholic and that the aim of the Constitution was that of defending and protecting the rights of Catholicism uh, against its enemies. So this was a constitutional charter that introduced representative government but was intolerant in nature. And this is a very important constitutional model because in the following decades it provided examples and inspirations well beyond Spain to Portugal, to Sicily, to Naples. And wherever constitutions were introduced in these countries or modified, they in fact took inspiration from this constitution and continuing to protect Catholicism as a national cult, linking citizenship to uh, this specific confession. So if we look at the popular literature produced in the 1820s, the political catechisms produced in Portugal, in Spain, in Naples, in Sicily, eh, to defend the Constitution here, the emphasis on democracy, is, which we find in the 1790s, is replaced by an emphasis on the compatibility between constitutional government and Catholicism. And I quote from a Spanish constitutional dialogue published in 1820, that he who would be a good Christian must be a good constitutionalist. A Sicilian catechism published in 1837, during the 1837 Sicilian Revolution, argued that Jesus Christ had come into the world to defeat violence and uh, uh, despotism. In fact, the 1820s were a, 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 a moment uh, in, in which uh, the, the impact of these efforts by uh, constitutionalists no, to gain mass support failed by and large in Spain, in Sicily, in Naples. But in fact, where there was a history of sectarian violence and interfaith conflict, new claims for political participation could be more easily, uh, sorry, could more easily win popular backing when justified in the name of religion. And this was true, of course, in particular in the Ottoman Empire, where such conflicts provided the ground for the rise of proto-national and, crucially, intolerant movements that linked a new language of rights and emancipation to the defense of a specific religious community. This is, to begin with, of course, the case of the Greek Revolution as an anti-Ottoman, anti-Islam uh, revolution that was sort of justified more often than uh, 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 not in the name of the defense of orthodoxy. If you, if you read the public dom documents produced during the Greek Revolution, you, you find some sometimes cases of manifestos in which 
the revolutionaries argue that there was a fight against injustice, against despotism, and not against Islam. But in most cases, actually, the enemies of the Greek Revolution were Muslims. Eh? In fact, uh, the, the Greek community as a Greek uh, genos was united, if you look at the manifestos of the revolution, by our eternal faith, eh? a faith insulted by the Turks. This is the most common sort of uh, line of argument in, in, in the public documents of the Greek revolution. Uh, so the various constitutions uh, produced during the Greek revolution uh, always linked citizenship to Christianity, not necessarily to orthodoxy, because the, f the, the European powers wanted all Christian communities to be um, uh, uh, sort of included. The French were protected, protecting the Catholic minorities in the Aegean Islands, um, for instance. But the Greek Revolution is not the only case of such intolerant uh, sort of religious proto-national movements of the period. We, we move further east, we find, for instance, the case of rebellions in Lebanon. Eh? Um, where Christian populations supported uh, religious-based movements for autonomy and actually took the Greek example as a model to follow. So one source of influence was the Greek Revolution in Lebanon. The one important also political trigger for these movements was the Tanzimat Decrees of 1839. Eh? So the Christian Maronite Rebellion of 1841 against the Druze in Mount Lebanon sparked uh, the uh, development of a proto-nationalist uh, movement based on a religious identity, stirred up both by the local Maronite church and by French Catholic missionaries. And, and re Christian rebellions in this part of the Mediterranean followed this pattern in the 40s, in the 50s, uh, up to the um, early 60s. What contributed to the stirring up of this popular uprising was the appeal of the millenarian expectations used to justify them. Now, and I, here I borrow an expression from Sanjay Subramanian's uh, sort of influential work on the sort of Mediterranean in the 16th century to argue that the period also between the late 18th century and the mid 19th century can in fact be described as a millenarian conjuncture across the Mediterranean, during which revolutions, anti-colonial rebellions, and demands for people rights were often justified in providential and prophetic language that presented them as the inevitable outcome of a divine design. And we find many instances, and I can provide very many examples of this. I will just sort of give you a, a, a very few of them. If you read, for instance, the sermons um, read out in churches in Naples and out, outside Naples in 1820 and 21 by constitutionalist priests supported the new regime, you see that they were um, supporting the establishment of a constitution uh, um, in the name of the Bible, but also in terms of the inevitability of the rise and consolidation of constitutionalism around the world. You had itinerant preachers announcing the advent of a new era across Sicily. Well, in some cases, um, um, this millenarian language adopted during revolutions was the product of the readaptation of more ancient or more traditional millenarian uh, 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 sort of um, um, cultures. I'll just give you a, a couple of examples. In Portugal, there was a, a, a prophetic tradition called Sebastianismo, uh, based on the belief that the wise king Sebastian, who uh, lived and died in the 16th century, would come out of his concealment to lead Christianity and uh, create a fifth empire. So these uh, ideas of the of, of this uh, Portuguese king coming back to recreate an empire uh, sort of became fashionable again in Portugal between 1820 and 23, uh, when some argued that uh, King or Emperor João, who was exiled in Brazil, coming back to Portugal was in fact the new Sebastian, uh, sort of revitalizing, regenerating Portugal with a constitution. But perhaps the strongest millenarian tradition that is revitalized in the 19th century uh, uh, in the Christian world is the orthodox one of the 
oracular tradition, uh, 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 sort of that dates back to the 16th century, uh, a tradition that uh, sort of uh, spoke about the emancipation of the Orthodox community from Ottoman captivity uh, that would uh, 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 um, happen in, in, in future. There were lots of prophecies going around monasteries, from monastery to monastery, and also uh, discussed by ordinary people in the Greek Revolution. And in the 1820s, this ancient tradition uh, 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 is ad adjusted to the context of the revolution. And in that context, the expectations would be that Russia, the great Orthodox power of the world, would come and rescue their insurgents in the name of religion. But millenarian expectations were rife also uh, uh, um, in, um, in Islam. They were uh, common in North Africa, um, and they, they um, sort of intensified um, uh, in a period that coincided uh, with the, third, the beginning of the 13th century of the Islamic faith. faith. They were intensified in the 1840s in North Africa, in Algeria, by, uh, um, by the the arrival of the French, you know? And so these millenarian expectations served to mobilize vast sectors of the population against the French in, in the 1840s. Uh, a famous anti-colonial uh, sort of leader, Bouzian, in 1849, proclaimed himself as the Mahdi, as the new prophet chosen by God to free uh, its country against the French. In southern Europe, uh, from the late 1830s, providential and millenarian themes became available specifically to justify popular sovereignty and democracy, thanks to the circulation and impact of Felicites de Lamennais' writings and his words of a believer. Now I come now back to uh, uh, why <laughs> Monaldo Leopardi's, you know, uh, reaction is so important or, or is telling of what was going on, not just within Italy, but within the whole of Southern Europe at the time. Uh, so I mentioned before what was the novelty of, of Lamennais' writings. So look, let me remind you that what Lamennais uh, um, uh, discussed also in millenarian terms was the in inevitable emancipation of people from oppression, tyranny, and poverty. As Lamennais described this process as part of a providential design that would ensure the restoration of the kingdom of God on earth. Uh, so religion in his vision had this kind of empowering, liberating uh, meaning, but it also had another meaning that was equally important. For Lamennais, Catholicism legitimized people's power because it subordinated it to a superior spiritual authority. It would otherwise, in, in other words, tame the otherwise brutal and anarchical forces of democracy. Democracy was good, argued Lamennais, when he was Christian. If he was not Christian, it was just anarchy and the destruction of social bonds. Now, these sort of two different aspects of Lamennais's uh, arguments are crucial. Uh, are really crucial. So the circulation and adaptation of Lamennais themes from, uh, uh, from his international bestsellers, they were tr translated into Italian, into Spanish, into Greek, into Portuguese, made for what I would argue a Lamennaisian moment in, su in Southern European political culture. Uh. Although the reception of his text and the adoption um, sort, of, uh, 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 sort of varied from place to place, and they also reflected sort of uh, uh, in different ways the, the, the combined present in his thought of these two different aspects, no? the liberating, emancipating force of religion, Christianity, as a religion of a kind of... Uh, people's rights, uh, sort of uh, justifying and legitimizing popular sovereignty, on one hand, and on the other one, uh, the, 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 the stabilizing, taming you know, uh, element of Christianity that channels, conveys, controls popular sovereignty at the same time. These two, uh, two aspects uh, also are reflected in the national adoption of his ideas. 
And I'll just give you again a uh, very few examples. No, because the reception, for instance, of Lamene in Portugal, I go back to Portugal, coincided with the end of the civil wars in 1834. Uh, Portugal had been affected by civil wars for more than, uh, um, more than six years, a civil war that had confronted the uh, um, Dom Miguel, no, the, the, the monarch, uh, um, and also the anti-revolutionary, sort of absolutist monarch, uh, confronted him, uh, sort of contrast, uh, oppos um, opposed him to the supporters of Don Pedro and Dona Maria, the supporters of the constitutional regime. And this was a bitter civil war that involved and mobilized uh, vast uh, sort of uh, sectors of the Portuguese society on both sides, against and in favor of the constitution. So the reception of Lamennais' ideas um, after uh, 1834 very much reflect you know, this specific national context. In um, commenting on the translation of Lamennais' Avos do Profeta in 1837, the liberal Alexander Herculano defended the constitutional government that was being reintroduced in Portugal at the end of the civil wars but also made a crucial difference between the rule of the plebs, eh, the gentalia, the rabble, which he described as democracy, which would only lead to the despotism of the masses, and a proper constitutional government supported by the people who were the educated. Eh? So this is um, crucial. But the perceived need in the late 1930s to refound liberalism on the basis of a reformed Christianity uh, was also, uh, uh, we can, all, uh, can also be found in Spain because in the 1830s you also have in Spain civil wars uh, uh, opposing supporters of constitutional government and supporters of, of the absolutist leader, Don Carlos. And here, to the translation of La Menée and discussions about the democracy very much reflect uh, 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 this uh, sort of local context um, of having to come to terms with uh, the existence of large sectors of uh, society being hostile to liberalism, being hostile to constitutionalism. So what do you do? For the translator of uh, La Mene in Spain, uh, Mariano José de Larra, uh, Spain finally required a revolution based on a new Religion, not the one supported in 1820 or 1812 by the Cadiz Constitution that was intolerant. Eh? At the time, the Spanish liberals wanted to protect the religious integrity of Spain. Now, Lara argued Christianity or Catholicism had to become tolerant. So toleration and, and freedom of religion had to be introduced in Spain at this stage if a religious revolution and a constitution um, sort of... Uh, uh, was hoped to become a permanent feature of the political life of the country. In Greece, the publication um, of the Parole d'un Croyant in 1860 coincided with the mounting hostility against King Otto, authoritarian style of government, which led to a popular revolt and his dethronement in 1862, eh? uh, which marked the introduction of a new constitution uh, providing universal male suffrage. So here, the uh, sort of social groups uh, opposing King uh, Otto's uh, uh, government, the younger intellectuals living in Athens, the students, the civil servants, the military officers rallying in defense of constitutional government, read this text as an anti-tyrannical text uh, in, 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 in Greece. Uh, but Lamene was not just a text that influenced political leaders or great intellectuals. In fact, what is striking about its influence and circulation across southern Europe in the 40s was that, that his ideas became integral part of the new ideologies of workers' movements. So it became also part of working class ideology in the 1830s. For instance, it was adopted and read out um, well, his texts were read out in the patriotic societies uh, where the artisans of Lisbon were discussing and advocating universal suffrage. Uh, 
Um, it was also the language adopted by the workers um, of Barcelona, the textile workers of Barcelona in the 1840s and um, 50s, um, who read La Monet, uh, sort of emphasizing particularly uh, uh, the historical mission that he attributed to the people as depository of a new spiritual power. Eh? So not just the kind of middle class discourse, but also working class elites. And let me just now go back to Italy now very briefly, because La Monet was also, of course, very important in the Italian context. Otherwise, Monaldo Leopardi would have not bothered to, 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 to produce a pamphlet you know, attacking La Monet. Uh, La Monet was read you know, very widely in the Italian states before unification. And uh, uh, of course, he had a huge influence of Mazzini among others. Uh, so, and he was also read in the context of new millenarian expectations in the Italian peninsula as well. Uh, millenarian expectations revitalized in the Italian peninsula in 1846 by the election of Pope Pius VI. Millenarian expectations uh, adopted and, and sort of a millenarian language adopted by uh, uh, the revolutionaries of Mazzini's short-lived Roman Republic in 18. Uh, 49, who adopted publicly, and uh, this was written in the entrance of the parliament in Rome, the motto, Lamanesian motto of God and the people. So the 1848 um, Italian revolutions, whose wide appeal at the beginning owed much to initial papal support, seemed to confirm the effectiveness, but also the limits of religion as a tool of popular mobilization. They also demonstrated the extent to which the relationship between democracy, religion, and toleration was still controversial at the time in Italy and beyond. Uh, in fact, in 1848, you've got some Italian revolutionaries like Mazzini uh, in Rome and Montanelli in Tuscany who uh, argued about the compatibility between the Catholic message and uh, freedom of conscience and freedom of religion. Eh? But this was by no means sort of uh, a kind of universally agreed uh, 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 position on the relationship between republicanism, democracy, and religion. In fact, in 1848 and 49, the Sicilian father Joaquino Ventura uh, uh, argued uh, in favor of democracy, uh, like uh, uh, Mazzini or Montanelli, but put more emphasis, first of all, on the stabilizing impact of religion uh, upon democracy than on its liberating effects. Uh. He actually emphasized very clearly uh, that uh, democracy could only be turned into a force for good uh, if it was combined with Catholicism. Otherwise, it would really display, without any limitations, its destructive effects uh, 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 leading up to dictatorship and tyranny. So Catholicism could tame it, otherwise democracy would end up to, um, uh, in, in the destruction of social bonds. First point. Second point that we find in Ventura is that uh, his own specific Catholic brand of democracy was in fact incompatible with freedom of conscience. Eh? It required the exclusive practice of the Catholic cult and the recognition of papal supremacy. But also if we look at the popular literature produced in 1848 and 49 to defend revolutions, you also find that not all political catechisms written for the people advocated toleration. Eh? To remain in Tuscany, eh? a Tuscan political uh, catechism published in Florence in 1849, i consigli politico-religiosi di un cittadino toscano, um, praised the revolution, but also defended the protection of Catholicism as state religion, praising religious homogeneity, the religious homogeneity of Tuscany as the best means to avoid civil conflicts. A, an argument and a theme that you find earlier on in the 1820s. No? It was good that Naples, that everybody in Naples was Catholic. 
because this would prevent civil wars. You know, look at what happened in France in the 16th century. You know, we are so lucky. You know, this social and cultural integrity is a great advantage that we have and we should protect it. And this is something you find again in 1848 and 1849. Now, I'm coming to the final part of my presentation just to remind ourselves that another factor that sort of provided constraints uh, to, uh, to a kind of po positive redefinition of democracy you know, in religious terms was also the capacity uh, of counter-revolutionary and conservative cultures to exert their hegemonies over society and impose their own political interpretation of the faith. And that's why I started my talk with Monaldo Leopardi. You know, this may have been a, uh, you know, a minor text within his larger production as the towering figure of Italian counter-revolutionary culture in the 19th century, but counter-revolutionary culture was alive, thriving, and kicking, and powerful across the Mediterranean, um, um, and throughout the first half of the 19th century. And I don't have um, uh, time to elaborate on it in detail, but what I want to emphasize here are some of the key features of this counter-revolutionary culture that we find in this text by Monaldo Leopardi, but we find more broadly in counter-revolutionary thinking uh, uh, within the Orthodox world in the Ottoman Empire, in Spain, um, in, in Portugal, uh, in, in, in France. First of all, the idea that revolution, uh, revolution is a heresy, and revolutionaries are heretics or atheists. Eh? In fact, Monaldo's Leopardi's title is that you know, he was rewriting uh, Lamennais' uh, uh, words of a believer um, when he was a believer. Uh, Lamennais' writing in the 30s is no longer a believer. Eh? He is a heretic. And this is a key feature of counter-revolutionary culture across the Mediterranean. Uh, counter-revolutionary thinkers would condemn their enemies, people advocating revolution, constitutional regime, or democracy as uh, uh, Protestants, as uh, uh, Jansenists, as Jews, as Muslims, uh, or as uh, non-believers, or in general as heretics. Uh. The second shared feature of this counter-revolutionary uh, culture, we find it in, in, in Monaldo, but not only in Monaldo, is that it equated democracy with the disintegration of all social bonds and with anarchy. A social condition that would inevitably lead to civil war and represented, in fact, the ultimate subversion of the natural and divine order of things. But in fact, this notion of democracy uh, as subverting the natural and divine order of thing is shared by the political elites of uh, the um, ruling over the Mediterranean at the end of the period that I wanted to discuss in the 1850s, the moderates or conservatives who, unlike the counter-revolutionaries, were aiming to combine revolution and counter-revolution, but also were horrified at the prospect of mobilizing the people. The counter-revolutionaries in Spain and Portugal in particular have no qualms about a sort of uh, uh, mobilizing the masses. Eh? They, they are not worried about it. They, they have a direct contact with the masses to the extent that the great Catholic conservative, Spanish Catholic conservative Donoso Cortes argued that the, uh, Don Carlos, the leader of the counter-revolution movement in Spain, was a democratic monarch because of, uh, and, and so his rule would lead to tyranny because he, he was advocating popular uh, mobilization. So, in fact, moderates, whether the Piedmontese ones that led the unification of Italy, or the Spaniards, neo-Catholicos of the Portuguese, or the Greek ones, be, uh, sort of advocated the notion of progress as a moderate anti-revolutionary and Christian uh, process uh, that would inevitably establish a uh, uh, constitutional uh, government uh, across the world, but also rejected the notion of popular sovereignty and uh, sort of rarely abandoned uh, uh, the sort of uh, a theocratic idea of what sovereignty was, uh, uh, the, the divine origin of uh, 
of sovereignty as something that historically would be uh, sort of gradually uh, uh, associated with different institutions, but not with popular participation. An idea that you find in, um, in Piedmont in the 1850s uh, um, with Balbo or Gioberti, and in general in the leadership, no? uh, uh, um, the Piedmontese leadership no? that controlled Italian unification in between 1859 and 1860. I, I am running late, and I'm coming now to my conclusions very briefly to argue that, in fact, between the late 18th century and the mid-19th century, the rise of mass politics and the, counts, uh, the cycles of revolution and counter-revolution combined with attempts to rebuild and stabilize the political order made religion more, not less relevant, and its political uses more important than ever. So I'm arguing against secularization theory here. Eh? 19th century is not a secular century, it's a religious century, first point that I, I want to make and I hope I've demonstrated in my talk. So in all circumstances, those who employed religion for political purposes normally did so not only to justify rebellion and insurrection against the enemy, but also because they were concerned to find a solution to the problem of reconciling order, authority, and freedom. And this tension between these competing objectives of emancipation and stability also as I hope I've demonstrated, informed the practice of conceptualizing this new idea, historically new idea of democracy in religious uh, terms. Uh, indeed, while democracy remained contentious throughout this period, religion nonetheless offered tools to criticize excessive inequalities and to legitimize popular political participation, eh? emancipating this notion from its negative consultation, and helped out, uh, helped it to, helped out to turn it into a respectable political option. But equally, those who defended democracy and, or presented it as an ineluctable, ineluctable social uh, tendency uh, very often saw a need to buttress people's power with the moral principles that could be found in the Holy Scriptures. Uh, so, given the turbulent context in which people's power came into being um, across the Mediterranean and in which it, its legitimacy was asserted, it is not surprising that it was often linked to visions of political communities that were both, in theory and practice, intolerant, insofar as they relied on religion to exclude and expel, as well as to include and empower. Thank you. Have some time for questions, so uh, use the microphone to ask them with. Perhaps I can ask a question then, uh, Maritim. Um, in the classic analyses, millenarian uh, thought or millenarian movements are the products of political despair. No groups that do not see any um, possible ways of reaching the desirable goal. And I'm wondering whether, you, you've taken millenaria, it was only one part of the discussion, but I'm wondering whether this sense, the political communities that carried millenarian thoughts are in fact, um, do they have a common f um, sense of despair, incapacity to find the means to reach their, um, their desirable goal. Yes, because, no, I, I think you're right, and I mean, I would agree. I mean, in a way, these are, you know, these are movements that are kind of almost impossible, no, in their aspirations. And I mean, in the 19th century, revolutions are crushed all the time. They, they're not successful. I mean, and also the counter-revolutionary movements, they're all millenary, and they also fail, no? So all kind of... Uh, movements that sort of break from the established political order adopt a millenarian language. No? Uh -huh. From uh, the Carlistas and Miguelistas in, Port in, in Portugal and Spain, no? who uh, argue against um, the Constitution, to Mazzini. Uh? 
Uh, so, and also to the anti-colonial rebellions in the Ottoman um, world. Uh. So, in fact, the sort of the winners of this battle are, are and in, in the short term, are neither the revolutionaries nor the counter-revolutionaries, are the kind of moderates whose idea of, of religion is different and whose notion of democracy is closer to the one upheld by the counter-revolutionaries. Yeah. So, yeah. yes, I would agree with so, you. Thank you very much. Um, Leopardi lived in the Papal States, of course, and I was struck by the fact that you didn't refer to Italian nationalism except in those two extreme forms of revolution and counter-revolution. Would you comment on the existence of the neo-Guelph movements, yes. that, uh, which of course Leopardi yeah, wasn't, yeah, but yeah, there are yeah, other people, particularly yeah, in the yeah. Papal States, who supported yeah. social justice and supported yeah. Italian independence, but under yeah. uh, a hierarchical... Yeah, yeah. No, yes, I, I mentioned in, indirectly it when I spoke about the moderates in Piedmont, but this, that could apply to, I mean, you know, Gioberti. I mean, I mentioned Gioberti. I mean, yes, their uh, idea, well, they're sort of uh, um, at the center of their, you know, political beliefs was this idea of Christian progress that was crucial because Christian progress is something that uh, uh, sort of... Um, can uh, accommodate change, but change that is gradual, that is not revolutionary. Huh? Um, um, and, but it is also sort of historically determined. No? So there is a, a design, you know? there is a, a direction in history, that direction Balbo, for instance, argued, or Gioberti, was the creation of constitutional regime, but without a revolution. So, so um, religion sort of uh, serves this purpose. The other one is, is that it challenges the notion of popular sovereignty. I mean, you, you can combine popular sovereignty and, and religion, as Mazzini Lamene did, of course, but uh, the moderates or the neo Guelphs, uh, in fact, um, advocated the notion of the divine origin of sovereignty that came from above, not to legitimize power from below, but to legitimize basically. The, 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 the sort of gradual, slow creation of institutions leading up to representation, but as a process that came from above, fundamentally, yes. So it's all about reform and progress, the, 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 the two kind of buzzwords that are combined with the notion of um, Christian progress. articulate what I'd, I'd, I'd like to say, but it's not actually a question as such, but uh, what I'd like to understand a bit better, are you saying that uh, religion was used after all by all political forces yes. at the time yes. to either um, uh, stamp the, the, um, uh, the danger of the masses seen in a, in a, a pre, um, let's say pre-Marxist, I don't know whether it would be the right way to talk about a pre-workers um, movement, the masses like the Neapolitan Lazari, for example, who could be dragged, you know, into, uh, who, the, for example, the, Neap the Neapolitan Republicans uh, of the, the, the Neapolitan Republic could not harness, but were harnessed by the, what's the name of the priest who led the counter-revolution and brought down the uh, Neapolitan Republic. And then later, um, you know, used um, religion against, um, or they, they would use religion to say, well, we don't have to give in to, to mass, particip mass participation. Mm. So, um, yes. is it like different degrees totally. and yes. different sure. ways of using religion yeah. to legitimize different movements? Yeah. No, no, it's a very important question. Thank you for raising it. I don't know it if I no, understood correctly. No, 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 no. yes. What, I'm, what I've tried to argue is that there's no imagination of any form of political order in this period that is outside a religious framework. There are, but they are a minority, fundamentally. What, that's what I'm arguing, and this applies to any political movement of the period, also the counter-revolutionary ones that are modern, they're new. And what, you know, what 
I guess um, implicit in my talk is the idea that you cannot understand democracy or liberalism or revolution or constitutionalism without looking at counter-revolution, that the two movements actually help understanding each other. And they're both modern and both influenced by each other. There's a dialogue that, that, that we need to retrieve, otherwise we do not understand them. I mean, the fact that Monaldo Leopardi you know, feels that he has to rewrite Lamennais' a kind of a democratic parable, but biblical parables, is telling that you know, counter-revolutionaries have to do something with the new language invented by their enemies. They, they have to say what is the nation, according to them. They have to say what is democracy. What they have to say what is liberalism. They, they have to say what is constitution. So counter-revolutionaries in the 19th century are not traditionalists. They are you know, revolutionaries as well. You know, they are modern. They are new. They are different. So what I'm saying is precisely what you suggested, that every political movement has to engage with religion and do something about it. And was La Monet actually using religion as well as the counter-revolutionaries as a strategy? Or did they believe in, relig in Christianity? No, I think he believed he it. Believed. But okay. in some other cases, in some uh, other sort of intellectuals that I studied, uh, there is a mismatch between, uh, for instance, what they say in the parliament in Naples in 1820-21, where, for instance, they advocate toleration of other cults, other than Catholicism, privately in houses. Okay. They want that. That's okay if it's private, not public. But then when they write a political catechism to the masses, they argue against toleration. So there is a double standard because there is this awareness that you need to educate the masses, and the masses would not understand toleration. Religion is the answer to the big question of the post-revolutionary era in the world. After the French Revolution, the French Revolution, Robespierre and the terror create a trauma. You know. What do you do to prevent that from happening again? Even if you're a believer, as Mazzini was in people's rights. You want people's rights, but you don't want you know, um, um, the you know, individuals going around your cities cutting the throat. You know, of, um, of, 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 of the wealthy. So that's the uh, sort of uh, million sort of um, dollar question at the time. That's my view, at least. No, Thank you it's so actually much. not my view, but it's, um, that's the, my starting point. Thank you. Any others? Thank you for a very interesting talk. Uh, I don't know whether you'll be able to draw any parallels between the way nation building uh, was developed uh, in the relation between democracy and Christianity, Catholicism, Catholicism, and the way it developed in Protestant countries, so especially in uh, Northern America, especially in the United States. <laughs> I, I have ideas. I have ideas. Well, I have ideas about how my story relates to Latin America, for instance, that is quite similar, you know? um, uh, because okay, toleration is controversial, uh, and uh, Lamene plays a huge impact. I mean, Lamene was a bestseller in the Rio de la Plata or in Chile. Um, um, also, well, I mean, religious toleration. Uh, is not necessarily a given even in Great Britain in the beginning of the 19th century. I mean, the emancipation of the Jews or Catholic emancipation is very controversial. In fact, what is interesting is that the Italian counter-revolutionaries say, you know, why are you arguing on, um, in favor of the superiority of Protestant countries as tolerant countries? In, in look at what Britain is doing to Ireland, for instance. Um, so, so I guess... What I actually don't, I mean, I don't know about the states, to be honest. Certainly, what seems to be is that the French idea of uh, secularism and the toleration introduced by constitution in France is the exception rather than the opposite. You know? <laughs> uh, that in, sort of, uh, sort of uh, intolerance is the norm <laughs> uh, rather than the other way around. Um. Uh, talking about uh, Monaldo Leopardi, I, I remember reading 
um, on Aldo's angered reactions to one of the aristocrats, neighboring aristocrats, who had lost his life in the Greek Revolution. So complaining that people should not go and fight other people's battles overseas. And, yes, absolutely. And he didn't like the Greek Revolution, even if it was Christian, yes. <laughs> exactly. So in this case, religion was not for him a good justification to, uh, to fight against the Ottomans. No, a because a it's a rebellion against authority. Okay. I mean, also the a... patriarchy, patriarchate in, in Constantinople is authority, and the Greek re revolutionaries were, re were rebels against the patriarchate. The patriarchate did not want a Greek revolution. The patriarchate argued that the Ottomans were protecting, you know, the, the, the Orthodox community. I mean, although the Ottomans cut, you know, well, uh, slaughtered, actually hanged a number of patriarchs in the 1820s, one after the other, they made a mistake because they pushed more Greeks into the arms of the revolutionaries. But the, auto, uh, you know, the, the, the Orthodox Church or, or the kind of hierarchy is against the revolution. But also in the case of Monaldo, yeah, I mean, there are different views among also conservative thinkers in the early 19th century, Christian conservative thinkers. You know, you've got uh, Chateaubriand, who is in favor of the Greek Revolution, for instance, and he's a Catholic conservative. Monaldo Leopardi is against it. You've got also Orthodox conservatives who want the emancipation of Greece under the imperial protectorate of Russia without a revolution. So there is no single conservative response to the Greek Revolution, even among conservative Christians at the time. But Mon Monaldo's reaction is by no means peculiar or exceptional. Yes, I was also thinking about how he could not reconcile the idea of being high, uh, strongly religious and uh, a fanatic of the pap papal state on the one hand, and the idea that actually religion could be the uniting element for the whole Italian nation, which is not, of course, was not an idea that was clear at that time. I mean, the yeah. fact that Monaldo was religious and, and a fervent Catholic at the same time did not help him see this common religious Yeah, but why would it? There is a universal community of Catholicism. There is a universal community that goes beyond the boundaries of this imagined community, as he describes it, which is the Italian community, it's imagined, it does not exist. And then you've got the city, you know, we are loyal, our fatherlands are the cities, are Prato, Florence, and the existing states. The Italy is an imagined community. I mean, he was right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I can see that we've moved dangerously into the phase called the Pause of Prance. <laughs> um, so I would just like to thank Maurizio again for an extraordinarily stimulating uh, talk. Thank you.